Hi everyone, this is Israel Garcia, and uh, here you are in the Disrupt Everything podcast series with a new international guest. This time, somebody really special, um, which I feel a strong alignment based on the self discipline life. He has a quote. He has many quotes, but one that I highlight for the start of this podcast and this video is we need to look at our mind, body, and emotions as tools. We own them. They don't own us. Being a disruptive, holistic high performer, so being able to make a big difference, pays off in today's world. It's not anything weird. But we've been indoctrinated to think that only a few can achieve the status of a high and a top performer or organization. It's a lie. This positive disruption will come, will come to you when you can see the world in, in a way that the, the majority can't. How? Taking into account perspective that your team is not capable of imagining or having the guts and insights for doing something that your colleagues won't do under any circumstances. Your own disruption comes during and after experimenting. Being disruptive or not has nothing to do with uh, being a scientist or engineer or a visionary entrepreneur or living in Silicon Valley. It's more a core skill at the reach of anyone willing to chase it. Disruption every day is being decentralized by individuals and heretics like you on our next guest. We are here to help, to help to see and help see by ourselves here and now. And for accomplishing this task, we have an international guest. We have the big honor of chatting and interviewing Tandapani, Hindu priest, prolific entrepreneur, and a former monk for 10 years, and also a big spiritual and mindful disruptor a worldwide leader, and holistic high performer. And Abani, welcome. Thank you, Isra. Thank you for having me on your show. We really appreciate it. Be the person you needed when you were younger. This is Dan Abani. And now we go with Disrupt Everything podcast series. Tandapani is an injured priest, entrepreneur, and a former monk for 10 years. After graduating university uh, with a degree of electrical engineering, he left behind to become a Hindu monk under the guidance of one of the Hinduism foremost spiritual leaders of our time. Then it becomes what I have to spell the name, Sivaya Subram, Subramuniyaswamani. Ah. You did it very well. Can you, can you, can you say it for me, Dandapani, please? Yes, yeah. Sivaya Subramunia Swami. Sivaya Subramunia Swami. Subramunia Swami. Swami. <laughs> you, you just have to say, you have to say two letters at a time and don't panic. <laughs> Subraya <laughs> Muniya Swami. Oh my God, <laughs> that's my rusty English playing my role, you know? For 10 years, he lived uh, a life of serious personal discipline and training at his guru cloister monastery in Hawaii. When his spouse expired, he chose to venture into the world of making in the New York City as his home. He worked uh, there with entrepreneurs and some of the top athletes in the world, helping them out. Uh, to understand and leverage their mind so they they can be at the best of, at what they do. He does that by empowering uh, empowering them with tools and teaching that have been used by Hindu monks of his tradition for thousands of years. Among his clients are, are companies such as Fortress Investment Group, Iconic, McKinsey, Revit Capital, Red Ventures, Splinker, Nike, Trivago, Amex, Red Bull, you name it, and more. He and his wife are also 
now passionately creating a 33-acre spiritual sanctuary and a botanical garden called Shiva Ashram in Costa Rica to further and broaden their mission. So it seems we are in the same country. I'm in San Jose and Dandapani yes. is uh, somewhere in Costa Rica. Um, in Osara. So that's in Osara. So that's the yep. big synchronicity and the wonders of uh, living every day. Dandapani, yep. welcome to the Show the Everything podcast series and thank you for the chance to be uh, with us and uh, share your experience, Thanks. knowledge and wisdom with us. No, thank you, Israel. Thank you for having me. So yeah. when designing your, the interview and the questions I, I, would, love, I would love to ask, um, first question I, I pondered and I also ask some of the biggest disruptors being in the podcast is what, what are your lifetime highlights? So if you were about to put your life in a timeline since you were a child, since you can recall up until now, um, what would you say that were your lifetime highlights and why? Uh, good question. Never have been asked this one. So thank you. <laughs> how, okay. How many do you want? Two, two, two or three? Yes, two or three. Couple, yes, couple. exactly. Two or three, four. Yeah, I would, you... yeah it, if we're looking at just experiences and not just one time thing, then I would say, you know, living with my guru for almost three years in the monastery before he died was probably the most profound time in my life to, to live with him every day, uh, learn from him, get trained by him, eat with him, meditate with him, pray with him. Uh, it is the most blessed time of my life for for sure that that I would say it was very very special uh, I would say it was a was a really big highlight of my life you know I I, I don't also want to highlight that everything uh, that highlights should only be things that are positive you know when, when my guru died that was a, a big highlight of my life uh, was it a great experience? No. Uh, was it devastating? Yes. But was it a turning point in my life? For sure. You know, it, uh, if you're talking about spikes in my life, in my timeline, then that, that was definitely one of them. You know, his passing away uh, was a huge experience in my life. Leaving the monastery was also a big, a big highlight choosing i i didn't decide to live in the monastery for 10 years my goal was to live forever as a monk but i i decided to leave at some point and so that was a huge decision to to leave so that was another highlight and and i would say the most recent highlight is moving to costa rica you know three months ago uh, we've been living in new york for the last 10 11 years and you know, our goal was to create Siva Ashram, is to create Siva Ashram here in Nosara, in Costa Rica, on the Western Pacific coast, and to finally move here and live here and begin our journey of creating this is, is a, definitely a massive turning point as well. What, um, why was so, so profound this time you were living with your guru and what happened when he died? Yeah, so I, I would say, you know, the, one of the unique things about my guru was um, he approached spirituality quite differently than a lot of other spiritual teachers. Uh, I, I grew up as a Hindu, so I would go and meet a lot of gurus and swamis and monks, um, you know, to listen to them. What I loved about my guru's approach was he took a very goal oriented and step-by-step -step approach to its spirituality. Whereas uh, he, he would quite often say that a lot of times people don't take that approach when it comes to spirituality. But, you know, if you look at everyday life is where, you know, everything that we do, almost everything that we do, we follow a process. And, and people don't realize this, right? They're, they're not cognizant of the fact that we're following a process. I'll give you a simple example. Most people take a shower every day, right? 
some of us are blessed that we can take a shower every day. Before you shower, you take your clothes off, you, you get wet, you check the, depending on where you're living, you check the temperature of the water. You know, maybe in Costa Rica, the water's not cold, so it's okay. But if you're living in England or somewhere where it's winter in New York, you know, you get the water the right temperature, you get wet, you put soap, you wash the soap off, you wipe yourself dry, you put new clothes on, you leave the bathroom. It's what, seven, eight steps, I don't know, something like that. You never mix those steps, right? You always follow those sequence. You don't go in the shower with your clothes. You don't put soap on your dirty clothes. And then you take your dirty clothes off, you put your new clothes, you wash your new clothes, then you wipe your new clothes down and then you leave, you don't. You follow the process, you stick to the process because the process gets you to the goal. What is the goal? The goal is to, to clean your body. And a lot of people don't take, so in, basically in everyday life, we have those processes. We put our socks, we put our shoes, we tie our shoelace, three steps. We always follow that steps. We don't put the shoes, tie the shoelace, then put the socks. <laughs> and, and a lot of people don't take that approach to spirituality. They think when it comes to spirituality, people are very, uh, very loose about it. You know, the, there's very lack a lot of discipline and structure. People think that discipline and structure means a lack of freedom, which is quite the opposite. I think discipline and structure gives you tremendous amount of freedom. And so he, he, he took a very goal oriented step-by-step -step approach to spirituality and, you know, living with him and having the blessing of him in my presence, being in his presence every day and have him train me every day was amazing because he, it was almost like having a gym instructor with you all day long, as opposed to for just one hour a day at the gym, you know? And he not only taught me about my mind, my body, energy inside of me, so many different things about life. And, and to have such a enlightened master like that, to be in his company every day was truly a gift, yeah. What are the most what are the most impactful teachings you have received from your guru? What is the most impactful? Um, yes, teachings. Yeah, yeah I, I would say understanding how the mind works. You know, um, I talk about this a lot, and you know, you, you can listen to it on my TEDx talk and I have my online course. On wearing fake on wearing fake focus, I will put it on the show notes. Yeah, that's a great one. You know, I go into detail about it. It's basically understanding how the mind works, understanding the difference between awareness and the mind. But why I say that's profound, it's profound because we create everything in our life with our mind, right? Some months ago, you had a concept in your, in your mind, Israel. You had an idea, uh, an inspiration to create a podcast. It started in your mind and then you started to think about it and you think about it. How am I going to do it? What am I going to call it? Who am I going to interview? What kind of questions am I going to do it? What's the format? Should I edit it? Should I not edit it? Should I be raw? Should it be polished? It all started in your mind before it became physical where it's actually happening now. And if you don't understand how the mind works, how can you control it? How can you control it? How can you harness it? How can you channel it? to create what you want in your life, whether it's to manifest things physically, materially, spiritually, you have to understand the tool that you're working with. I, I always share this very simple uh, example is where one of my really close friends is a uh, Adobe certified expert or something like that, right? So he's been certified in seven Adobe programs, so Photoshop and InDesign and things. So I remember a few years ago, and he's a photographer as well. And a few years ago, he, he lives in Australia. He took a picture of a mini and he, he sent it to me like a mini, a, Mark, a mini Cooper, right? Car. And he sent me the picture. I was in, in New York and he sent, sent it to me on email. And he said, this is a picture of a mini I took by the side of the street. It's parked and I touched it up in Photoshop. What do you think? I said, yeah, that's okay. So what? You know, no big deal. It's a car parked on the side of the street. He wrote back to me and he said, they don't make four-door minis. I think back then they only had a two-door Mini Cooper. 
So he took a picture of a two-door Mini Cooper. He stretched out the car. He put two more doors on the car with windows and everything. And you could see <laughs> the reflections of the window of the trees, the building behind. You couldn't tell it was a, 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 a two-door car that he made into a four-door car. The point here is that he understands Photoshop so well. He knows how to use Photoshop so well that he can use it to create what he wants. The same with the mind, right? The better you understand the mind, how it works, the mechanics of it, the more you can leverage that understanding of the mind to excel in, in what you do, to be a better version of yourself, to be a better entrepreneur, to be a better athlete, whatever it is. But you can't be better if you don't understand the tool that you're working with. <clears throat> and, and what's the common denominator between the work you do with athletes, with um, entrepreneurs, with uh, great minds, and the common denominator with this, between this Hindu wisdom and monastic life? I don't bring a lot of monastical life into it because, you know, I, I do understand that it's quite different. I, I lived in a very traditional monastery, you know, Israel. And there's a lot of monasteries out there that are very, uh, if I can show it like this with my hand, I'm, I'm not, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you can go in there, stay for a week, and then you can go home and see your family and, you know, go on a holiday and meet your ex-girlfriend <laughs> and then come back stay for another two months, you know, and, and, and then you can tell people you lived as a monk. And, and I know a lot of people that say that. Gotcha. I, I, you know, I met one guy at a, at a event in, in New York. And he says, yeah, yeah, I lived as a monk for 10 years as well. And I'm like, oh, really? Which, which monastery? Wow. Oh, no, no, I, I lived in Jersey. And then, you know, and I said, really? It was a monastery. No, 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 I lived in this place. And then, but I would come every day to work to Wall Street and worked in, you know, in the financial district and go to work. I mean, like, that's not a monk, you know? So I, I lived in a very traditional monastery where I spoke to my parents twice a year on the phone. I didn't email them. I didn't write to them. I didn't talk to my friends, relatives. It, you know, we were monks under vows. Uh, other people can live there. All, all this is to say is that I think what, uh, I, for me, it's very clear that in Hinduism, there are two paths. There's the path of the monastic as a monk, traditional monk. And then there's the path of a household, a family person. So for example, uh, I'm a Hindu priest. As in Hinduism, a priest falls under the householder category, meaning a family man. So you take the Catholic religion, for example, the, uh, and you live in Spain too, right? You're, you're from Spain. Yes. Right? So there's, there's a lot of Catholic you know, monasteries and things like that. It and is. Catholic monks and Catholic priests are very similar. They lead celibate lives. They live by themselves or with other monks or priests in, in monasteries or churches, right? Uh, Hinduism, it's a different. Monks live in monasteries. Priests live as a household, as a family person. So even uh, now I'm dressed as a Hindu priest. It looks like a monk. It's hard to tell the difference sometimes. Uh, so I, I can get married. I have a wife. I have a kid. I can work at McDonald's so I can be an entrepreneur. It's totally up to me. As a Hindu priest, this is what Hinduism says. So when I train athletes and entrepreneurs, uh, I don't bring a lot of the monastic stuff into it because it's a very different life. But what I, the common denominator would be is that I, I always start with training about the mind, right? Because they, they I, I work with usually people that are very, very successful at what they do. And uh, where they're lacking is they understand the subject matter. They understand what they're doing really well they just never been trained on how to use their mind or how their mind works. So I give them, you know, from a basic to a deep understanding of how the mind works so they can leverage that to, to be better at what they do, to be a better football player, be a better entrepreneur. Um, what, what would be, what could you say would be the, the initial steps for understanding the difference between your mind awareness or, or training the mind in a, in a way that we, we become better at, at what we do. 
Yeah, the, the first step is really, and, and again, I just wanna be clear, this is only one perspective, right? This is the tradition I was trained and, and I'm sharing it. It's, it's not the only way, there are you know, thousands of different ways. Um, but I would say the first step is understanding the difference between awareness and the mind. And once you understand that and how that works, which you know, I've shared in my TEDx talk, um, I have an online course if people wanna go learn about it deeply, but that's the first place you start. The second sure. step after that is to learn how to develop concentration and willpower so that you can harness your awareness and focus it uh, on one thing. So how can I stay concentrated on you and not be looking at my phone while you, the interview is going on and checking my notifications or seeing what's going on out there? You know, I... I need to develop concentration and I need to develop willpower. So that's the second step. And those two things help you to focus. And my guru had a beautiful saying, Isra, he said, uh, where awareness goes, energy flows. So if I can put my awareness on you, that's where my energy is flowing. And I always say to people, life is a manifestation of where you invest your energy. Energy is like water. If I water the, the garden, the weeds and the flowers will grow. The water can't tell the difference between the weeds and the flowers. Energy is the same thing. If I put energy into something positive, it grows. If I put energy into something negative, it grows. So my goal is to be able to focus my awareness on my priorities in life. And therefore, my energy is going to my priorities. And that's what starts to manifest in my life. But if you look at most people, they're so distracted, right? So their awareness is jumping all over the place, which means their energy is going all over the place and nothing is growing. And, and that's then, why most people are not able to manifest anything in their life. One of the reasons, right? What, why do you think people, so how can we avoid these like thousand, hundreds, thousands of distractions and be concentrated and, and have this willpower. You, you have to want it, right? You have to want it. The, the biggest reason why most people don't do anything about it is because they don't want it badly enough. How badly do you want something? That's what determines if you get it or not. When my guru asked me when I was still in university and I told him that, yes, one, I want spiritual unfoldment, I want enlightenment, self-realization, this is my goal in life. He asked me, how badly do you want it? I said, I'm willing to give up everything. My family, a career, spouse, Children, food, chocolate, sex, beach, ice cream, everything. I'll, I'll give everything up for this. And I did. If you ask most people, what are you willing to do? They said like, oh, you know, I, I don't have $99 to buy your cost. But, you know, I, I do have $1,100 to buy the iPhone Pro X, you know. And, and I do have, you know, $100 to go out to dinner with my friends and buy wine and go out every Friday night to have dinner and enjoy things. But, you know, $99 to buy lifetime access to content that I've taken and spent years, two decades, over two, 20, 25 years condensing precisely into a very systematic process to understand here in one package. You don't have to leave your home. You don't have to give up your family. And it's like, oh, you know, I can't, I, I might do it next year and blah, blah, blah. But I'll go buy an iWatch. You don't want it badly enough. Most people don't want anything badly enough, Israel. And that's why they never get anything. The most successful people I know are so determined and are willing to do anything to get what they want. They really are. Do you, do you watch football? Yes. Okay. To give you an example, um, Mo Salah, the soccer player, football player, Mohamed Salah, mm -hmm. when he was in Egypt, he, as a teenager, would travel four hours one way by bus to go for training. 
and then travel four hours back again by bus to go back home. Eight hours a day in a bus to go training. You tell me if this man wants something or he doesn't want something. Every day, eight hours, four hours each way. You know, the best, it comes down ultimately to how badly you want it and people don't want it badly enough. They have a passing desire. Oh yeah, I really, you know, I want to have a successful life. I want to make money. I want to do this. And it's like, no, you don't. I want something badly. I am going to go for it and nothing is going to stop me. Someone asked me, I was doing an uh, event in London last year and so last year, no, the year before, uh, pre-COVID. No, actually beginning of last year, before COVID. And someone uh, asked me in the audience, you know, what if you die before you get your goal? And I said, well, um, I believe in reincarnation. I'll come back and still keep going at my goal. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Why why would I let that stop me? It resonates. Come back and just keep going. You know, why would you give up? just because you died well you're going to be born again keep going you know (laughs) you have to be determined (laughs) right yeah so so the day that when you die you're going to come back again and you're going to still try right that's the stop of all attitude yeah basically that's the attitude you must have nothing stops you the only one how how does how does 10 years uh, of hindu monastic discipline have shaped your life? Um, I I, I would say, you know, it's given me greater clarity on, on what is important in life. And it, it has also given me greater clarity on how precious life is. You know, I believe in reincarnation. That's the philosophy I subscribe to. Some people believe in one life, right? So for example, a lot of Christian traditions or Islamic traditions believe in in one life. You know, you're born, you live, you die, and then you may go to heaven or hell, uh, a concept like that. I I believe in reincarnation, but I know I have one life as Dandapani. Next life, I could be Joe from Idaho. I don't know right? But this one life I have is precious. It is really, really precious to me. I don't get a second chance. I only get one shot. And I want it to be amazing. And uh, the training I had in the monastery has given me the tools and the teachings to better understand myself so that I can really live a rewarding life, like a really special life, that this one life is truly special to me. You know, when my guru was dying, uh, one of the things he said on a few days before he died was, what an amazing life I would not have traded it for anything in the world. You know, what an amazing life I would not have traded it for anything in the world. And, and if you think, Israel, you know, if you can get to your end of your life and you can look back at your life and you think that was spectacular, hmm. wouldn't that be a great thing to say? As opposed to it look does. back and be full of regrets, you know? And I'm not saying I don't make mistakes. I make plenty of mistakes. I have lots of room for improvement, you know, uh, for sure. But I... The, the training I received has given me the tools and the insights to live a rewarding life. And I think that's what's lacking, right? As far as that most of us, I, I was blessed that I, I got a chance to live with my guru in a monastery, but most of us don't have these tools and insights. So therefore we don't get trained how to live a rewarding life. We go to school all over the world. You know, we learn math, we learn science, geography, history, biology, chemistry, all kinds of things, but no one teaches us about life. They don't teach you in your school how to eat properly, how to exercise, how your body works, 
you know, how to breathe, how to think, how to work with your mind, basic human skills, how to sleep, how to wake up. You know, that should be taught, right? Yeah, math, language, all important. Do we need to learn the periodic table? If you want to be a chemist, maybe. But if not, I don't think it's necessary to learn the periodic table. You know, I think it's better if you taught somebody how to breathe, how to eat, how to sit up straight, how to walk properly, keep a good posture, basic exercise, stretch, move. We don't, right? So I think that's why a lot of people struggle. And I was blessed to be taught these, these things in the monastery. Man, being good at school is, is great if you want to be at school forever, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I was terrible and, um, in school. And me too, me too. I, 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 I didn't pass the first course, man. <laughs> so I repeated the first course. I, I, I'm, I'm keeping. I, I still keep asking how was possible, but uh, I'm glad I oh, did. It. I, I don't know. The only <laughs> reason I, I got through school is because God loves me. <laughs> <laughs> It's the only reason. There is um, no way in hell otherwise I would have gone through school. Can you share with us uh, a bit of your training in the uh, monastery and and uh, and from your experience, the most practical way to build discipline? So they are really linked. Yeah. I I, I would say that discipline comes from love, right? If you love mm-hmm. something, you want, to, you want to discipline your life to experience more of the love. So I'll give you a simple example. If Joe likes to play the guitar, right? And he starts playing the guitar and he really likes it. The more he plays it, the more he loves it. So now he starts disciplining his life. His friends say, hey, let's go out today and go to a party. He goes, no, I have to practice, right? And he goes, uh, I don't want to go out every day. I'll go out with you on Saturday night, but you know, Monday to Friday and Sunday, I'm going to be practicing my guitar six hours a day. I love playing the guitar. So when, when you love something, when you're passionate about something, you structure your life, which is another word of saying you discipline your life so you can have more of what you love. I love my wife and my daughter and you know, my daughter's a little over two years old and I want to spend a lot of time with her, right? So ever since she was born, I needed to discipline my life a lot more. I needed to choose who I want to spend time with because now I have a new element in my life, right? So I still have 24 hours. I don't get extra hours Mm -hmm. because I have a daughter. So I need to say no to more people and more things so that I can give time to my daughter. So the love for my daughter helps me to discipline my life. And, and I think a lot of people don't have discipline because they don't have something they're passionate about. They don't have a bigger purpose in life. There's no big vision or mission they're trying to accomplish in this life. Therefore, no passion, no purpose, which doesn't breed love which then why do you need to discipline your life? And what, uh, what, your, what have been your best findings on, what, what been your best findings on, on calming the mind? Because as the way you, I, I was seeing you in some interviews, some, the TED Talk and we've been in focus that I will share also in the podcast show notes. And I saw you, you have a really calm, not only way to speak, to move, and also it comes from inside, this inner calm. So what, what have been your best findings on this? Awareness in the mind. My answer will always be this till the day I die. And you know what people <laughs> always say to me, a lot of people say, Isra, That's all this guy knows. He doesn't know anything else. He repeats the (laughs) same thing over and over again. I've heard this before. There's nothing new. And you know what the truth is? There's nothing new. You just have to learn this one thing. If you can control your awareness in your mind, you can control how you react and respond to things. 
And if you can't control your awareness in your mind, then your environment, which I define as the people and things around you, will control your state of mind. And if your environment is stressed, you will feel stressed. If your environment is anxious, you feel anxious. If your environment is fearful, you will feel fear. If your environment is worrisome, you'll feel worrisome. And if you can control your awareness in your mind, then you can control a lot of how you respond and react to things. I still have a long way to go in my practice. I'm still junior, you know, in kindergarten, learning about <laughs> awareness. <laughs> I, I need to graduate to level the next level <laughs> to, to, to primary school. <laughs> And then, um, because the more, uh, the more you learn, the more you realize how much you have to learn, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Is it is, um, yeah, it's, I've been my uh, the last book I published is, is about modern stoicism and talks about the dichotomy of control. You cannot control things outside of, con of your control, but you can control how you react, but how you can control them, you, you know, with this awareness, right? So, is any tip? or any practical hack or shortcut to gain this awareness to start working? Yes. Watch my videos on YouTube, on, online, or do my course. <laughs> that is the hack. I'm going, to, I'm going to do it. I'm, I tell you, I'm <laughs> going to do it. That's for sure. You know, for, for so many years, people would ask me like on podcasts and interviews, tell me how, tell me how, give me the quick, you know, uh, mm -hmm. tell my listeners how to do this. And I would tell them. And now I'm like, you know what? If you're serious about it, commit, go do it, it, learn it. You know? I love it. Uh, don't, don't come on Israel's podcast for a short, quick fix. There's no quick fix. It's painful year after year of practice over and over and over repetition of the same thing. And the problem is everyone wants something new. You know, they, they read a book and they go, okay, I read this book. Very insightful. I'll talk to my friends about it. And then I read the next oh, book. I say the I same. do this course. I do that course. I read another book. Oh, I read Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now. And then I read, you know, Tony Robbins. I read this book and you're like a, a library is useless because the library, all the library does is a storehouse of information. When does it become useful? When you can take that information, apply it consistently in your life to create change. That's when information is useful, right? Collecting information Hello. is useless. A monkey can repeat things to you, a parrot can repeat things to you. You know, when, when someone comes up to me and they quote another person or they told me what this person said, I go like, I, I can buy a, a parrot from the pet shop who can say the same thing to me. How, how is this impressing me? It's not. <laughs> Apply it in your life. Show me how it's changing your life. Then you will impress me. The long way, the shortcut is the long way, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yep, the shortcut mm. is the long way. And no so one wants good. to take the long way. Everybody wants the quick fix. So good. Everyone wants to, they finish a book and say, oh, I finished the last book of whatever. I'm going to start a new one. But I, will, I always say, just use one book for one year and just apply everything you do, take action. Yeah, we have a lack of don't, action. Don't read any other books. You know, there, there's a lot of people online, you know, there's people that, you know, I don't know what they call influencers or whatever they call these people. I'm not sure. They, uh, you know, they, they show all the books. You see this. Winning contest. On YouTube yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, no, no. I, I read all these books. I, I've taken the best information from each book. I've summarized it. You can go to my site. You can buy, you know, well, we need to be like Bill Gates, read one book a day. If you want to be a successful entrepreneur, like, you know how long it took that author to put condense all that information into the book years of him or her learning, processing, organizing. And you think just because you, you just took this tidbits information, you can go and create change in your life. I don't know what kind of crazy universe people live in their head, but you know. 
you put it into the words, the reality. Mm. Yeah, it's like people are smoking drugs all day long or something. You know, no one, no <laughs> one wants to do the hard work. No one wants to do the hard work. If you look at the, some of the top athletes in the world, like a tennis player, right? You think, Israel, how many times he serves the ball? He bounces the ball, throws it up in the air, and, and serves it. How many times he practices that? And, and maybe the best player, he doesn't have a thousand different serves. He might only have five or six, right? And, but he practices the same one over and over and over and over again until that, that movement becomes, shapes his mind, it shapes his muscles, it shapes his nervous system. Every part of his body, the blood even feels that, you know, then you start to, to live that. No one wants to do that, too much work. Give me an app I can sign up somewhere for you know weekend costs. You know, what do they say? Two, two, 200 hour yoga teacher training, right? <laughs> 200 hours to be qualified as a yoga teacher. You know, in my monastery, the one that I studied with my guru, to be qualified as a teacher, I'm not a teacher. I don't claim myself to be a teacher. I'm not a guru, not a teacher. To be qualified as a guru in the, the monastery that I lived in, the traditional monastery, you had to live a life of a celibate monk, complete detachment from family, friends, the outside world for 36 years before you're qualified as a teacher, 36 years. So you tell me that, you know, after 200 hours of yoga training with your Lululemon pants and your yoga mat and your organic <laughs> green juice, you're a teacher. I mean, like, give me a freaking break, you know? But I see, I see this is the, the way you, the way you, you, you share this, the way you speak is so resonant with me because you, as I know you seen this from a life of discipline, a life of, you know, a life of do the work. And then you see clearly what the path is. This is the one who everyone trying to avoid because everyone thinks that self-discipline is painful, but it's on the contrary. It's the painful that you think is painful. Mm -hmm. right. And how about... And, and commitment too, right? It's just committing to one thing, not jumping around. You know, today I study with this person, tomorrow I go study with that person, and then I don't like this teacher anymore because I saw him do that, and I think he's terrible, so I go find another teacher. And then, you know, I don't like who he's friends with, and I criticize her, and then I go there, and I do this. It's like... People are like at the buffet table, you know, just like jumping around from one thing to another. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. It is the commitment. So, how you, how we can be, you know, is another how. Huh? What have you discovered about how we can be the best in the world at what we do? What have you discovered over this? all these years working with people, working yourself, what have what been your discoveries? Again, again, you know, I would repeat definitely understanding yourself, you know, because understanding your mind, uh, I think being completely uh, honest with yourself. And, and what I mean by that is that your ability to look within yourself and take ownership of all the positive things and all the negative things and understand that all of that is what makes you. So when I look at myself, you know, and, and I'll, I'll say this to you Israel, you know, a lot of people, they've said this to me, they look at me and they think that, you know, my life is something special. Why I live 10 years as a monk, this is what I do. I travel around the world, I speak. They see me on YouTube, they see me here, they see me on interviews, they see me dressed like this. They think, you know, his life is perfect. He focuses all day, he's got no problem. He mm -hmm. you know, sleeps eight hours a day and he can fly through the air, you know? Uh, <laughs> but that's not my life, right? 
if, if I look at me, I see inside of me a lot of positive things and a lot of negative things. All of which I understand is me. Now, the positive things I try to build on and grow them and make them more positive. The negative things, I, I assess them and break them into levels of negative things like level one to level 10, for example. Level one are the easy things to change that maybe I can change right away or it takes me a day or two days or a week. And then like level 10 things, are, it's gonna take me maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to change. You know, they're deeply ingrained inside of me. Maybe certain habit patterns, way I think, things I say, things I do, right? All of this I own. I do not need to justify to other people outside of me, nothing, but I own this. That ability to take ownership of the positive and negative inside of you is I think one of the key things needed to excel in life. Because when I, when I work with athletes and entrepreneurs, I, I get them to look at every part of themselves. And some of the things are very hard to talk about because you, as soon as you talk about this, you're owning it, right? You're admitting that you have this quality, but you can't improve and you can't grow if you don't acknowledge the fact that there's, a, there's something to, to improve or work on. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? It, it makes sense. And you don't have to beat yourself up if you see something negative, right? So when, when I look at myself and I see my negative qualities and my negative patterns and negative tendencies, I don't get angry at it. I understand that I'm evolving as a soul over many lives and it's taken this long to get to this place and I'm still learning. I'm still learning and I'm still growing and it's going to take time uh, to make some of these changes. You know, I, I can't change them overnight. Is there, is there a, any set of uh, best practices that you follow to be at your fullest potential yourself? And if so, can you name a, can you name a few? Uh, I would say developing unwavering focus is critical because your ability to concentrate uh, allows you to get, first of all, so many things done, but also allows you to fully experience everything in your life, right? And, and fully leverage all, all your qualities. My, my ability to concentrate allows me to have really deep, meaningful experiences with the people I love, with the people I'm with, doing the things that I'm doing. So that, that, that is definitely one thing, the ability to concentrate. The second one I would say is learning to manage our energy. You know, we, we only have so much energy today. At some point uh, tonight, we're going to get tired and go to sleep. And depending on how well we sleep, our energy builds back up again. And then the next day we go out and we invest energy into people and things around us. But most of us never evaluate who and what we're investing energy in. So people talk about time management, but you know, very few people talk about energy management. How are we managing our energy? Who are we investing our energy into? I think if we can better manage our energy, better focus, you know, just those two things can help us lead uh, much more rewarding and fulfilling lives. What are, what are Dandapani's golden rules for living? <laughs> I, I don't have any golden rules, but if I need to make up some. Um, yes, please. <laughs> Okay, make up some golden rules on the spot. Let me see, what would be my, <laughs> my first golden rule? <laughs> my, um, I, I would say the first golden rule, rule is learn about your mind. Uh, 
understand how your mind works and leverage that understanding to create a, a, a beautiful life for yourself. The thing is, you know, you, I have a wife, I have a daughter, but I don't have to see them every day, all day, not every day. You know, like, you know, when my daughter goes to school or my wife is outside, I, I don't see them. But my mind, my mind, I live with 24 hours a day. I can't remove my mind. Even when I sleep, my mind is functioning. My subconscious is functioning, right? I'm dreaming. Whatever's in my subconscious is coming up. So golden rule number one is, you know, if you're going to live with something 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you better pay, pay attention. What you're living with. <laughs> start paying attention. Start understanding it, you know? Why, why would you live with something that you don't understand, you know, that's torturing you, that you can never separate yourself with? from yeah golden rule number two focus 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 and, and i would say that focus allows you to not waste the precious time that you're given on this planet mm -hmm. people think that they're 20 years old they're 30 years old they're 40 years old that no, oh, you know, I'm only going to die when I'm old. That's bullshit, huh? We don't die when we're old. Babies die, children die, middle-aged people die, old people die, young people die all the time. You know, you can tell yourself a lie that you're going to live till you're 90 or 100 and you die only when you're old, but that's not true. The minute we were born, somebody started a stopwatch, a timer that's counting backwards. You just don't know what the timer is and what the number says on there. But that started. And I don't care which God you pray to, how religious you are, what kind of life you live, it's coming. <laughs> and you better be ready, you know? It is. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you got to lead a focused life clear. Uh, and I would say golden rule number three is be clear of your purpose and priorities. Be clear of your purpose and priorities. So number one, understand the mind. Number two, focus, focus, focus. Number three, under, be clear of your purpose and priorities. Because once you learn how to focus, you need to know what to focus on, right? People would sometimes ask me, Isra, can you teach me how to focus? I said, yes, I can. Then I asked them, once you learn how to focus, what will you focus on? They go, I don't know. So you should know your purpose, your passion, your priorities, so you can focus on it. How, how, to be, how to be yourself when nobody really, truly means what yourself means? Can, can you ask me that again? I, I, I yeah. understand it better, yeah. How, how to be yourself when nobody really truly knows what yourself means so what you are uh, i i would say you know i i would define authenticity being authentic is when your inside is in alignment with your outside that's when you're being authentic. And maybe every day you're learning something more about yourself, but for today, as much as you know on your inside, you should live on your outside. Yes. I'll give you an example, right? Um, so take a yoga person. I'm, I, I hope the yoga people don't think I'm beating up on them, but uh, <laughs> like I, I've seen so many times where like, you know, there's like a yoga girl, you know, she, she goes to like a yoga retreat, you know, in India or somewhere and you're sitting in a circle, meditating, chanting Om, and you ask them, what's your name? And they say, my name is Shanti. You know, this is a white girl with blonde hair, right? My name is Shanti. That's her yoga name. Right. And then when she goes back to her office in New York, her name is Julie. So make up your mind. Are you Shanti or are you Julie? My name is Dandapani. 
when I'm on Israel's podcast. But when I go out and talk at a corporate office at Nike or American Express or Bloomberg, I don't call myself Bob or John. Oh, my name is John. No, I'm still the same guy. So I think, you know, for me, that's authenticity. You know, don't, don't pretend to be one thing, one place and another thing in another place. You know, if you go to a yoga retreat and you call yourself Shanti or whatever, then when yeah, you work Shanti. at your corporate office, it's Shanti, you know, make up your mind. Which one are you? You know, <laughs> I don't hang out with my white friends. I say my name is, you know, Bob. And then I hang out with my Muslim friends. I go, my name is Ahmad, you know, and then I hang out with my Chinese friends. My name is Chao Yuan Fat, you know, no, I'm still down to punny. Be just you. Yeah. Just be you. And, and okay, th and that's the thing I said earlier, right? You, you have to look inside and accept all of you, the positive and negative, you have to own it, right? You have to own it and say, I'm okay with this. Other people may not be okay with your negative qualities. I, I have a lot of negative things I need to work on. When people see that, they go, oh, Dandapani's like this, Dandapani's like, they are not okay with it, I'm okay with it because I know I'm slowly working on them to change them. And it's going to take some time. I can't do it overnight. It's going to take some time, but I'm okay with it. So I have no problem with this. You know, I, I never claim to be perfect. I don't need to be perfect. So therefore I can be strong. The strength comes from being, from acknowledging and owning all your shortcomings, all the positive and negative inside of you. You, you have to own it. And it's not something you need to be ashamed of as long as you understand that you are a work in progress and, and you're continuing to work and grow and change over time. Can you share with us your most uh, consistent, the most consistent habits that you practice every day? What do you think it is? Meditation. Right. Focus. From, <laughs> yes, that's one. <laughs> Good. And training the, training the mind. Exactly. You're a good, good learner, Ishra. <laughs> my most consistent habits, my, good, my two most consistent things I practice all day long is uh, learning to focus, uh, practicing focus, giving the people and things my undivided attention, and learning to control awareness in the mind. Where does my ball of light go in my mind? I work on that all day long. And that's my practice. And, uh, and what the skills... 20 something is... And what the skills has... What the skills have served you the most to, to... To be where you are? Skills meaning like... Uh, like, uh, for example, discipline, like, for example, commitment. I'm trying to see if I understand the question. So what skills help me to be where I am? Yes, yes, has served you the most, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I would say, unless you call focus a skill, that, that's probably a big thing for me, you know, learning, you know, the ability to focus because it's so easy to get distracted. You see opportunities, you see different things. Oh, that sounds interesting. I should do that. I should do this. Maybe I should pursue that. No, it's like always bringing my focus back to, to what's important, you know? Yeah. And now that the Azure... Hey, Isra, uh, just really quickly, um, I, I do have another meeting coming up in, in five minutes, so I think we okay. need to wrap up. Pretty we, jump on, we, jump on in the, we jump on in the rapid fire questions and we close. Okay, perfect, yeah. Okay. I got another five minutes and we can do that, yeah? Perfect. So we jump into the rapid fire questions. Uh, so first question is, what, what, what is the book that you have... Uh, that, that we all should read, the book that we all should read. I am not a good book reader, full disclaimer. Mm -hmm. I'm really bad at reading books. So <laughs> uh, uh, can I skip this question? Because I don't think I'm the sure. right person to Yeah. Perfect. 
Um, any any video or documentary that you recommend us? Uh, my TEDx talk <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to learn about <laughs> unwavering focus. A skill you want to master? Yeah. One skill I want to master? Yes. Concentration, focus. A, co a word to coin what you are? Oh, good question. Um, student. Mm. What, what are you most proud of? For myself or outside of me or? Universal. Um, I, I would say outside of me, I, I'm uh, most proud of I don't know I'm sure you got me on this one I don't mm. know, I don't know okay. the answer any regrets regrets no because I, I look at difficult experiences I've had in life mistakes I made in life as opportunities to learn and grow. And when I learn and grow from them, now they become a blessing in my life. It may not have been pleasant when I was going through them. Maybe I did something to hurt someone or hurt myself or something did something that was negative or something I shouldn't have done. You only regret when you don't learn from it. When you learn from it, it changes your life. And then you look back and you go, yes, it was not great, but I'm so glad it happened because now I'm a better person. So yeah, I don't regret them. The best learning of your life? Best learning of my life, that God is within me and that God can be experienced inside of your me. Big, and your biggest lesson? That I have learned? Yes. That awareness and the mind are two separate things and that you can harness your awareness and navigate it into the most refined areas of your mind to experience the very depths of you. And the last two questions for the for the rapid fire questions, what are your what are the top three persons that you ask for advice the most? Oh, uh, these are my mentors. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I should say their name or I can say their name. I don't know if they're mine. I should ask their permission. But there are there three guys that I talk to uh, very mentors. regularly three mentors and um, they are all based in the US and um, they are my go-to people for, for advice. Yeah, and the uh, last, thank you for asking. I know, uh, thank you for replying. I know maybe the, you can share with the, the names with us. Yeah. Um, who would you recommend me to interview next? Uh, who? Okay, let's see. Um, Jim Quick. Oh. Jim Quick is a good person. Uh, yeah. Really, really powerful. So I mind. Mm -hmm. last, last but not least is if you were about to launch a message in, uh, in uh, Bloomberg TV or in uh, CNN, worldwide message for everyone who was watching in a prime time, what would be your message, Dandapani? Understand how your mind works, learn to focus your mind and leverage that to create an amazing life. Is there anything else you want to add? 
That's it. We're on the same old message. <laughs> Where can we find you? Where can people that is uh, uh, watching or listening to this podcast can find yeah. you? You can go onto my website, which is dandapani.org. And I think it's where I'll put it up on, on the links. Yes. And you can also go to the App Store or Play Store and download my app. It's, you can search for Dandapani. It's a free app. There's some free content in there. Uh, daily journal quotes, uh, videos, and audio. And then there's also some three courses on there, which you can pay for uh, if you're interested in pursuing them. And Instagram. You can follow me on Instagram now most you know active is, on is there any and, and is there any way we can support your shiva ashram how this is going how can we follow the process yeah if you go to the siva ashram.org website s-i-v-a-a-s-h-r-a-m.org uh, and i'm sure i can send uh, israel put the link up uh, yes. we'll be updating it uh next month in march 2021 uh, updating the site uh, and we'll be sharing a lot of different ways that you can help and support but i think more once you look at the site what we're really looking for is uh, highly skilled individuals that have expertise in certain areas you know like irrigation of the gardens or architectural design or this or that you know solar insights lighting you know like we're looking for real experts yeah wow this is a good call for anyone who is maybe interested yeah who can advise us and give us good guidance on how, how to do things yeah. i can put you in contact with some of these people here in costa rica already so we'll be in touch oh perfect yeah that would be great thank you Isra. yeah <laughs> So, Nana Pani, thank you for your time, for your unwavering You're focus, welcome. for for your message, for helping us to work the mind, understanding the difference between awareness yeah. and the mind, and uh, for sharing the time with us. It's been a pleasure. Likewise, and thank you so much for all the great original questions. This is probably one of the nicest interviews I've done in, in years. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad. Really uh, and, and I'm glad is this. Yeah, yeah. And Thank I'm you so much. This, my pleasure. My pleasure. It's been an a honor uh, to share these moments with you. And as a final quote for Dandapani, yep. as soon as we control where awareness goes, we control where energy flows. As soon as we control where the energy is flowing, we control what is this manifesting in our life. And meditation is the art and science of directing, of directing awareness. Tanda Pani for the Super Everything podcast series. Thank you so much. My God bless you. Thank, thank you. God bless you too. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care. We stay in touch. Okay, we'll do. Thank you, Sra. Bye. Thank you. Bye. So, did you have the interview with Tanda Pani? As we don't do cuts or editing, he had to leave. I was pushing the interview. And um, we, I got, I skipped so many, well, not so many questions. I skipped like five, six questions, but uh, you know, every, everyone has his, his agenda and I was pushing the time and the questions, but we got to the end with a beautiful interview, really useful, really valuable, really powerful. You own disruption. Your own disruption could be a lifestyle, could be your way of life. Your way of work could be your job or even how you do business. It won't be forward, mo forward motion without disruption because we'll have a lack of aud audacity. No disruption, no disruptive economy. If you don't understand this, you won't survive any longer. Let's turn this into our asset. Being disruptive means breathing disruption and if you are listening to this podcast share it subscribe leave a review go to Dandapani website support him join us be part of the disruption leave a review in your favorite platform and you can download this episode the next one and the old ones the journey continues and it continues now <laughs>